let's move towards this idea of visceral fat and white fat versus brown fat, because I think we also need to unpack that fat, it, some fat's easier to break down than others. So talk a little mm-hmm. bit about what we need to know about visceral fat versus just subcutaneous fat mm-hmm. and, and in the context of white fat and brown fat. Yeah, yeah. So let me actually start with the white and brown and then then the subdivisions of white. So yeah, the, the, one of the ways, you, you just presented two ways of classifying adipose mm-hmm. t- of fat tissue. One is the actual color of it because of the composition of the mitochondria. So humans are mostly, most of the fat we have is white fat. Very, very low mitochondrial content. If you look at, the, at these fat cells under a microscope, it's almost entirely made of a big blob of fat, which is why it presents in a kind of whitish color. Mm-hmm. It's like little Crisco bubbles, you know, mm-hmm. almost in the fat cell and, and very, very low mitochondria, like I said. Mm-hmm. In contrast, brown fat actually does look like a darker brown. And it's because it has such a high content of mitochondria and the fat droplets, rather than having one really, really big droplet that dominates the entire thing, it's tons of little small ones interspersed amongst all the mitochondria and mitochondria do have a dark reddish brown color to them Mm -hmm. and thus indeed so much that the fat actually looks brown and and so brown fat exists to burn fat to make heat white fat exists primarily to store fat for later energy use so one is a heat producer which itself is a kind of inherently inefficient process but favorable in this case one is a very low metabolic rate, almost below the point of detection, but even by my instruments in my lab. But we can do it, and we have, but very low metabolic rate because it's not meant to burn energy. It's meant to hold on to it. Although that, just as an aside, that is selling the fat cell short, just as an interesting <laughs> aside. Like, for example, the hormone leptin. Leptin mm-hmm. is a fat-derived hormone, and we leptin has been framed in the context of a signal from fat cells to tell the brain we're full. And yet it never should have been known as that because that effect is kind of modest, actually. Oh, interesting. What it is absolutely essential for, I mean, I'm I'm literally essential, is reproduction. If you remove someone's leptin, they are totally totally sterile. There is zero reproduction. Yeah, exactly. And yet there are multiple other hormones that act as a satiety signal. So as much as leptin does have a satiety effect, there are a hand dozen, there's a dozen other hormones that do Mm. the same thing. Huh. But if you take out leptin, total sterility. They cannot reproduce. And, and so anyway, that's just a fascinating effect so of the fat cell yeah. back to the conversation we had earlier with regards to reproduction. If a little girl gets too, if a, a, a girl gets too lean, she doesn't have enough leptin and fertility stops. If a younger girl gets too chubby too early, she has too much leptin and it initiates the process too soon. And now she's going through puberty at six years old or so. So the fat cell, white fat is tremendously important in all kinds of things, in addition to just storing energy. And now, it's, the, it's the white fat that's making leptin. Yep, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and women make more leptin than men. If we took out a comparable, a, a little scoop of fat from a man, a little scoop of fat from a woman, her fat cells are making a lot more leptin than his. And that's just further reflection of the need for the female to have a lot of these checkpoints in assessing her environment, including metabolically, to know, all right, can I commit to the metabolic marathon of pregnancy and then mm. and then lactation? So with regards to white fat, then, in brown fat is mostly in humans. It's mostly sprinkled through this thoracic space and, and just sort of for fun, wondering why. And I joke with my students that a scientist cannot answer why. We can answer how and what. But supposing and philosophizing as to why it could be that as much as we're shivering to try to warm our body if we're cold, you can't shiver in your head. And so how can you keep the blood in your in your head warm? Maybe huh. by having a lot of little incubators here, it can warm the blood up before it hits the carotid vessels and then keeps the brain warm. Maybe because there's no shivering here. Fast as much as I as much as I wish there were because I need a little more okay, wait, <laughs> insulation. Wait. Wait, I just have to stop. I think you just proved why women are smarter than men because we have we have white fat right here on our chest <laughs> called breasts. 
Maybe they were put there so that it could yeah. more it could fuel our brains. Maybe that's yeah. what's going on here. Well, I love it, and I, I won't go. I won't say anything too crass. But I'm going to use that line on my wife and see if yes. I can't get some benefit from I it mean, from God myself. God just said, "Hey, you need to be smarter. We're going to put two lumps of fat yeah. right on the yeah. front of your chest, so it goes up and fuels the brain." <laughs> So that's all speculative, but I love it. And I'm going to, when I get home, I'm going to tell my dear Cheryl, I'm going to say, hey, I need to conduct a test and see how warm your <laughs> chest fat is. <laughs> this could go, this could go dark really wish, fast. Wish me luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wish me you luck. report back. <laughs> yeah. I predict it's going to go very well <laughs> now, but with white fat in mind, in fact, you know, adipose tissue stored subcutaneously, including breast tissue, it is interesting to note now the differences between men and women, because it is significant that there are two depots of white fat, and you listed them both at the outset of the question, namely subcutaneous, which is the fat that you can pinch and jiggle. If it's pinchable and jiggable, then it is, it is subcutaneous fat. Okay. If it is the fat that is visceral, then it is tucked deep within the muscle of the mm. abdominal cavity. And you can see this on, a, on different men. Let's imagine two men, two drinking buddies. They go bowling and fishing and drinking together. They're both the same percent body fat. One of them has fat that spills over his belt and it is loose and folded and wrinkled. That's subcutaneous. The other one, who's just as fat, it stands out hard like he's almost pregnant. It is this big, hard expansion of his tummy, and it doesn't drop down over his belt because it just is protruding straight out rather than hanging down. Mm -hmm. That's more visceral. It's mm -hmm. tucked within the organs of his abdominal space, pressing out against the stomach of the, th of the, uh, of the abdomen. And so, so that's very different. Indeed, it is not. Now, why is visceral fat so much more problematic? And maybe even before I go to that, where a person stores fat is both is, is genetic, mm -hmm. even within sexes, and then very much hormone dependent, okay. where estrogens will more stimulate subcutaneous fat, whereas, whereas androgens will not. So androgens do not stimulate as much subcutaneous generally, and thus the man will default to having more stored viscerally. But this is a consequence of the woman who's going through menopause in the absence of any hormone intervention. Yeah. Her fat will literally start moving away from the subcutaneous fat storage to the visceral. Now, why is that a problem? And why does that make her a metabolic mortal like her male counterpart already is? It's because of the size of the fat cell. And subcutaneous fat has, if you will, an almost limitless site depot like the people who make are the subject of tv shows my 600 pound life or etc mm -hmm. that is entirely subcutaneous mm. they may have only a very modest amount of visceral fat and that's just genetic largely and in fact most people could never get that fat because they they don't have the the ability to continue to produce that many fat cells but estrogens enable the production of more fat cells particularly at the buttocks and the hips so at those sites, if a woman has a pressure to store more fat because insulin is high and calories are sufficient to fuel the growth that the insulin is signaling, you need both of those signals to tell the body to store fat. In her case, she has a fat cell that gets a little big, and then she'll make another one. And that one gets a little big, and then she'll make another one. So her fat cells, even though she has more fat than her male counterpart, her fat cells are smaller. Small fat cells are anti-inflammatory and insulin sensitive. So small fat cells are healthy fat cells. Ah, now, okay. in the guy's case, he's not growing most of his fat through subcutaneous. Most of his is visceral. Well, you cannot have unending growth in that visceral space because if you allowed those fat cells to continue to multiply, you would literally start crushing your intestines, crushing mm. your liver, pressing on your, your heart and your lungs, and you would die. And so those fat cells end up self-limiting themselves by one, not undergoing hyperplasia or multiplication and thus only growing through hypertrophy. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, on one hand, it keeps the person alive because of those fat cells, like I said, were multiplying. It would crush all the internal organs. Mm 
But the fat fat cell or the fat cell that's undergone hypertrophy, it has to it has to take on two adaptations to ensure its own survival, both of which end up creating problems for the body. First one briefly being that it has to become insulin resistant to prevent further growth. Mm -hmm. And then number two, it has to become very pro-inflammatory to stimulate the growth of new blood vessels because as it's getting so big, it's starting to get pushed. They're pushing each other further wow. and further away from capillaries. They become so far that they start to suffocate. So they start releasing a host of pro-inflammatory proteins that kind of act like a trail of breadcrumbs for the blood vessel to start growing out to nourish that suffocating fat cell. But the combination of those two adaptations does really spread the insulin resistance throughout the body. Is there a, a That's different... The difference. Yeah, that was beautiful. That was one of the best explanations I've heard of the difference. And I'm curious then, is there a different behavior that we need to be able to get rid of brown fat versus oh. white fat? Well, yeah, just to make sure you ask that question, the question correctly. So we don't want to get rid of brown fat. Right. We, we, we want... But do but you mean the difference of getting rid of visceral versus vis subcutaneous? Exactly. I was going to say, let's okay. go visceral to subcutaneous. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Now, just to just by way of that first question, ketones actually make white fat behave more like brown fat. Mm. So brown fat has a really high metabolic rate that's roughly comparable to muscle tissue, whereas white fat has an almost negligible metabolic rate. In humans, we found that if a human's in ketosis, their white fat metabolic rate triples. So wow. it goes up three times. So that's a meaningful change. So just to you know help people understand that you kind of can blur that line a little bit in a metabolically favorable way. Now, visceral fat and subcutaneous fat do burn differently or break down. They undergo lipolysis at different rates. Specifically, visceral fat is generally considered, I suppose, by the body so problematic that at any moment, visceral fat is going to respond more to a stimulus to burn more, to break down more. So especially in response to epinephrine or catecholamines, this is why one of the reasons if someone has more visceral fat, I actually think do whatever you can to get acclimated or the courage to do some kind of ice bath or some cold mm, therapy. I was going to ask you, I've heard. Some yeah, because that is studies. a very effective way to spike yeah. epinephrine. And epinephrine will induce relatively more lipolysis at the visceral adipose than it will the subcutaneous adipose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so so it's it, there's really what I'm hearing. It's not like if I go on a long hike versus weightlifting, those two activities aren't going after visceral or subcutaneous different. They're, they're, it's, it's not like I can target it like that. Other yeah, than, well, other no, than make no, well, some good ketones, you can't target it. But 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 the body, if it is any stimulus that increases epinephrine and exercise does, visceral is going to relatively go more. Now, in the case of the woman, she has so little visceral that that's not really getting tapped right. as much, and that's largely again that's largely estrogens based. If if it is a woman who's going through menopause and and sort of diving all in. With the, with the estrogens coming down, then she will start to store more fat there. And so I would think in that case, all the more reason to, to take these kind of interventions like cold therapy a little more seriously, because you do not want to force your body to start storing fat more viscerally. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense.